Well, uh, Dr. Cornell West, you don't need an introduction. Your reputation uh, precedes you. Um, and I just want to welcome, welcome you to the show. It's a pleasure to have you. Uh, you and I have met. Um, you probably don't remember me, but uh, we've crossed paths at various points in our lives, whether it was at Harvard or whether it was at Standing Rock. So welcome to the Red Nation podcast. Well, I'm so very, very blessed to be here and to be in conversation with you and to renew our uh, encounters and relations and dialogues, though, brother. Definitely. You are Lakota right out of South Dakota. That's right. <laughs> and living now in Princess Town, Minneapolis. Well, I should, I should, I should be so narrow and it is not Princess Town. But... <laughs> it, it is Princess Town. That's, that's one of the beautiful things about this place. It's There's always purple rain. <laughs> oh, that's a beautiful way of putting it. Man, we miss him so. Like, uh, we miss him so. But you say you and your parents are doing all right, and that's a beautiful thing. Yes, yes, sir. So um, I just, I would just like to start the conversation off with uh, what's inspiring you today, and what inspired you to to run for president. Well, you know, part of it is though, brother. I've had so much love and and courage and uh, uh, joy poured into me by my parents, Irene and Clifton, and my church, Shiloh Baptist Church, and the Black Panther Party when I was growing up, that I have to bear witness to it. You know, I have to be able to uh, to let it out. And that just means trying to tell the truth and seek justice in my own fallible way. And the American empire now is in such internal decay. You know, we're headed toward almost a second civil war was Trump and his neo-fascism, but also the, the empire is declining externally. Uh, uh, and we're headed toward a third world war with the proxy war with Ukraine, in Ukraine with Russia. And so I said to myself, well, how can I raise my voice, speak my truth, try to pursue justice? And that means, of course, you know, speaking some very painful truth. And truth is a jagged edge phenomenon. Man. It, it cuts both at ourselves, but also at, 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 at our largest society in which we live. And uh, um, I just didn't see anybody in the political realm raising these kind of painful truths and really seeking justice for uh, the least of these, the folk who have been treated most viciously and so forth. And, uh, you know, I've always hated this narrative of slavery being uh, America's original sin. And I come from, you know, my foremothers and fathers were enslaved Africans. But to, to miss out on the European encounter with precious indigenous brothers and sisters and to really talk about that original sin, that genocide, uh, 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 encounter with the diseases and the military and the de degradation and the subjugation and the stealing of land and the stealing of of, 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 of of culture and trying to marginalize memories. You see, that's a truth that just has to be told. And that's why in my speeches, I always talk about the, um, the hoods, the barrios, but the reservations, they all go hand in hand in terms of uh, uh, precious peoples who have been uh, so oppressed and and degraded, and yet are fighting, and yet are still resilient, and yet are still resistant. So that's the reason why I decided to just have this black freedom struggle spill over into electoral politics. That's what it is, though, brother. It's just a moment in a larger movement. And uh, in that sense, I'm not in any way like an ordinary politician, you see, <laughs> conform to the party, trying to win the next election. How much money can I raise and how many lives can I tell that hides and conceals the crimes and the hurt and the misery that's out there in the world, not just here, but abroad. And I'm part of an international movement, really. I'm concerned about oppressed peoples in Latin America and Africa and Asia. Uh, and in Europe, in the Middle East. Uh, but that's what this campaign is all about, my brother. You know, one thing that really inspired me, because I, I, you know, I'm very cynical. I read the news on a daily basis. I follow politics. The last two election cycles for president have been incredibly damaging and demoralizing, not just for indigenous people, but for people in this country, but around the world. And 
One thing that has always inspired me as somebody who is a Lakota person is my my spirituality. I don't talk about this, so you're mm. getting a rare, <laughs> you're getting a rare thing, um, uh, as as somebody as a guest on this podcast because you have that soul fire uh, that really speaks. It, it goes beyond the intellect, right? It goes straight into your heart, into your spirit. And when I heard you were running for president, I was like, I was like, I gotta listen to this man's speech. I turned on Katie Helper's podcast. I listened to the whole thing and I was inspired. And and it strikes me because anywhere you go in the world, you go to Brazil. I was in Brazil and you had the indigenous people of the, the Amazon rainforest who were doing these encounters with people from the Catholic Church who had invested themselves in liberation theology, who were part of the landless workers movement. And they were all professing you know, something that was beyond just the human world. And I, I wanted to ask you how central spirituality is to social movements and social justice, but also your campaign as a president or for president. Yeah, what well, I'm telling you, my brothers, uh, I am rarely asked that kind of profound question because spirituality in a utilitarian culture, spirituality in a highly commodified culture, is some kind of a ghostly affair. It's mamby pamby. It's hollow and it's shallow. Uh, whereas for me, as you know, and for you, and so many of the traditions that have shaped you and I, spirituality is at the core of who we are. And what is spirituality? Well, it's soul craft. It's the way in which our souls have been crafted and sh and shaped and fashioned based on the love that we've received from mom and dad and aunt and uncle and brother and sister and cousin and friend and comrade and the dead as well as the quick, the dead as well as the living. And now for me, when I think of spirituality, it's, it's not just my own particular prophetic Christian faith, but it takes me right to the heart of black music because you see, uh, uh, the 20th century was the most barbaric century of recorded time. And the greatest spiritual breakthrough and artistic breakthrough of 20th century in the Western world, one could argue, was black music. And that's one of the reasons why it has become so disproportionate in shaping the soundscapes of the world, every corner of the globe. And what is music? Well, music is that which is beyond language. The pain is so intense. The hurt cuts so deep that the what is beyond language? Silence and love and sound, music. So we moan, we groan, we cry, and we transfigure those moans and groans and cries into sound, not just noise, because that's people who sing out of tune. I'm, I'm talking about <laughs> <laughs> I make a lot of in the shower, you know what I mean? But Marvin Gaye is making music, you see. And, and this black musical tradition is always set at the center of black life. It could be the church. It could be any institution. That, 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 that music, because that catastrophe that, and the pain that goes with that catastrophe, the fundamental response was a musical response. Almost the way black folk can walk and talk and stylize space and time. That's musical. See? The dialogues, musical. The preaching, musical. The singing, of course, acoustic and musical and so forth. And that is what spirituality is. It's flesh and blood, soul crafting at the visceral and the cerebral level. So it's not anti-intellectual. <clears throat> And you know, we are there when we're at Harvard, you know, oh shoot, we partake of the life of the mind. Yeah, please bring it, bring it. World of ideas, yes, we want it, we, we want to embrace it. But we bring in more than that. We bring in our bodies, our memories, our histories, the best of our communities, the loves and courage and integrity that we learn from those who love and us with integrity and courage, you see. And so that's really at the core of who I am, though. That's why almost every speech I give always begin with, I am who I am because somebody loved me. I am who I am because somebody cared for me. Then I mentioned Irene B. West. 
I mentioned Clifton West. I mentioned my brothers, my sisters, Shiloh Baptist Church, Black Panther Party, on to who this particular crack vessel named Cornell West really is. So that brief uh, interruption, I was just recommending you, you watch an amazing documentary called Rumble, which is about the history of native music influencing uh, rock and roll and R&B and a Choctaw musician named Link Ray wrote a song in the 1950s called Rumble, which is the, you know, the title of the documentary. No words, literally just guitar riffs, but it was inspired by, you know, Choctaw traditions. And it was so threatening to the status quo that it was the only song without words. There were no lyrics to it. And so there was the only song without words to be banned from radio play because that is the potential of that kind of you know soulfulness that that is unquantifiable and you called it this utilitarianism that we we tend to apply and i i want to ask you another kind of follow-up question about that because you know somebody who considers himself on the left uh, and part of progressive uh, movements especially in north america it does seem that they the kind of secular nature of these movements tends to resist that kind of spiritual, the, the embrace of the spirituality uh, aspect. But if you look at Standing Rock, you know, you were there. It was, I'm sure you had some kind of ex a spiritual experience because we began the day, we began the action, we began everything in deep contemplation and what could ostensibly be called prayer or ceremony, right? Um, and the Black Freedom Movement was also grounded in that kind of, uh, that kind of connection. And I was wondering if you could just elaborate just a little bit more on um, why that kind, those kind of spiritual traditions, whether it's in the North, you know, the North American context or across the globe, are so important for resistance movements and social justice. Absolutely. Because I think what we actually have in the wisdom of your precious foremothers and forefathers and my precious foremothers and forefathers is this stress on soul craft, character formation, and virtue uh, uh, shaping. And that's different than just ideological commitment or political conviction. You see, our secular brothers and sisters who've been deeply influenced by the authority of science and the new physics, uh, they tend to downplay that which cannot be measured so that, so that the magical and the mystical and the immeasurable are, are pushed to the margins. Whereas for us, we recognize that because we're in, we, we, we got our whole bodies in it. So the bodies and souls are inseparable. So that the memories are not just cognitive, but they are existential, almost like body memory. Uh, and that's, that's the very raw stuff of spirituality. That's the raw stuff of music. That's the raw stuff of the magical and the mystical. And, it, and it, it, it goes hand in hand, I think, though. And you tell me what you think about this. I think it goes hand in hand with a radical humility because you recognize you're not in control. You recognize it's not all about you. You recognize there are mysteries out there that go beyond your rational capacity, but you still can have relations with them that take the form of a self-surrender and a selflessness. And I think that's a beautiful way of being human because I think actually it's true. I really do. I think that modern science has tremendous, you know, breakthroughs in its own way tied to modern technology, but it has a truncated worldview. Hmm. What the great Alfred North Whitehead called one-eyed reason rather than hmm. two-eyed. <laughs> So that our traditions are not anti-reason, they're mm -hmm. not irrational, but they are transrational. They go beyond the rational. They go beyond the logical. They're not anti-logical or illogical. They embrace the logical and they go beyond the logical. That's what the mystical and the magical is all about. And of course, all one, all, all you need to do with even the secular brothers and sisters just talk about their experience of falling in love. <laughs> 
and, and, and as soon as they begin reflecting on that, things get yeah. magical, mystical, <laughs> immeasurable. You say, oh, well. So why did you do that? <laughs> exactly. I see. You're not in control, are you? Uh-huh. It's fascinating. But that, and that's one of the reasons why it, it takes us back to truth talk. To, oh, no, we're really talking about the truth in the experiences of our secular brothers and sisters. You talk about their falling in love or their love for their parents or their love for their kids or their love of beauty as an artist and so forth. And so in that way, I think you and I have been deeply blessed to really be right in the lap of such profound traditions that have shaped our souls and our character and our sense of virtue. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't, you just get up in the morning with gratitude. Mm. Thank you for being Lakota. I mean, you know, it didn't have to be that way. You know, thank you for being a black man. It didn't have to be that way, you know? Yeah, I think, I think of the aspect that you said is kind of a radical humility. And I, and I think there is a, a humility in our own kind of philosophical tradition, if you want to call it, or understanding the com cosmology is that in our understanding, humans are not the center. We are one of many you know, relations. And, and it's, it's about being in correct relation with the rest of the world. And that begins with each other as human beings, because we have the most control over those relations. And so as I've gotten deeper into the politics and the movement, I've actually gotten closer and closer to my own understanding of, you know, that spiritual commitment. And it's both temporal and spatial, as we understand it, as Ikche Wichasho, or is what we call the common person, that's the highest ideal in the Lakota society is the common, the common person. It's not, there was no king or queen. And in fact, people who were in leadership positions were often pitied because they had to give away so much. They had to constantly show uh, that there was, if there was surplus in society, it was a disgrace because somebody was in want or in need of something. And so that was one of the things that we held on to. And part of that connection, you know, like I said, is, is spatial and temporal. We originated from, you know, our, our Al-Aqsa mosque, our, you know, holy site is, is the Black Hills or Hisapa, the, the heart of everything that is to us. That's not just a, there's a cosmological side to that. It's connected to constellations and our relation to the universe, but there's also a practicality to that. That's where we that's where our language came from. That's where our culture came from. That was the way that we learned to live and become human beings. And so when you take something that like uh, that away from us, that spatial aspect, that spatial connection, you're taking away that kind of broader kind of spiritual and cultural understanding. And, you know, you probably heard of this temporal kind of uh, saying of seven generations, and there's many meanings to it, different Tribal nations have different interpretations of what seven generations mean. The way I was taught and the way I come to understand it was that it's actually about three generations before, three generations in front of you, and then you are the seventh generation. You are living, it's, it's, you're looking as much in the past and the future as you are to the present. That means that if you, if you, you lived a good life, if you met your great grandparents, and your grandparents, and your parents, and you lived a good life if you met your children, your grandchildren, and your great-grandchildren, because you have those generations in mind, what came before and what is coming, you know, in front of you. And I'll, I'll, I'll just finish it with this, because one of my favorite, uh, uh, you know, uh, I was blessed to have this relative in my lifetime. Her name is Elizabeth Cooklin. She just left us. Um, she's a Dakota thinker and philosopher. She, she told me once, she said, you do not even own your own life. You're only here to ensure the coming generation. And maybe, you know, there's kind of a, you know, a, a fatality to that or a fatalism to that. But to me, that's the highest honor to have. And it's not just to ensure generation, you know, life in, in you know, oppression or life in, in struggle, but to ensure that maybe the things that I will not accomplish in this lifetime will make the generation that precedes me better, right? And, and that's what I believe it means to be an, a good ancestor to, to future generations. Yes, oh no, 
Brother, I'm 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 with you 100% on that. That to me is unadulterated wisdom. Much deeper than knowledge. Hmm. More profound than insight and discernment. Wisdom. And wisdom is something that's a result of blood, sweat, and tears. It's a result of unbelievable struggle and contestation and sacrifice. And um, as a Christian, it would be almost cruciform. Hmm. You know, you have to go through cross-like experiences in order to emerge with that kind of wisdom. And wisdom is always much more readily accessible by example than it is just words. We talked before about the limits of language. You know, that wonderful moment in T.S. Eliot's uh, Burt Norton, where he says the words break and slip and slide and are so inadequate. This, 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 uh, this raid on the in, ineffable, raid on the inarticulate language gets in the way, as it were. Tony Morrison and in, in, in Beloved talks about how uh, the music and the sound must break the back of words. Well, it sounds like Sister Elizabeth was an exemplar of this wisdom that goes, uses words, but it's cut so much deeper than words. It breaks the back of those words and gains you access to these examples that you want to be a part of, imitate, emulate, uh, learn from as you live within this larger tradition. Hmm. These, these waves and oceans, these chains within a much larger, larger chain of past as well as future. And, uh, you know, like you, I just think that's, that's a, that's a desirable, desirable way of being in the world, man. Mm -hmm. It really, because, you know, you got the joy and the pain. <laughs> you know what I mean? You got the wisdom, but every form of wisdom, still we fall short because all of us are human beings. So we have a certain kind of wise ignorance or learned ignorance that Nicholas Acusa talked about. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, you learn how to love, man. Mm -hmm. You see, I mean, the worst thing of, of modern culture is, is Hamlet. Hamlet is the great example of modern culture. One of the why Shakespeare is such a towering figure and Hamlet suffers from the incapacity to love. Hmm. And if you go through life and you never cultivate the capacity to love, you never lived. Mm -hmm. Dostoevsky says in Brothers Karamazov, he says, hell is those who suffer from the incapacity to love. Now, you know, the Russians had no monopoly on truth and the British have no monopoly on truth. Black folk don't have monopoly on truth. You know, we all have our own rich cultures, but mm -hmm. they do overlap. Mm -hmm. in terms of wrestling with life and death and joy and sorrow mm -hmm. and sadness and and, and, and and gladness and so forth. And there is, there, there's certainly an overlap among the species, I think, in that regard. Mm -hmm. It's just that when you look at the, uh, the history of the modern world and the Europeanization of the world, it has been your precious people, it's been precious indigenous people who have born more of the brunt of the brutality and barbarity. Because 1492 is the beginning of the age of Europe. 1492 is the beginning of the 500 year, 500 year or so war against indigenous peoples. Mm -hmm. Psychic, spiritually, materially, socially, economically, uh, geographically, and so forth, you see. And uh, more and more of that's coming forward as we come to the end of this particular uh, epoch in the history of the species. And we'll see, you know, whether the species mm -hmm. even survives given the organized greed of these fossil fuel industries and so on. Hmm. The Haudenosaunee, um, which is also known as the Iroquois Confederacy, called George Washington... Uh, the first president of the United States town destroyer, a name that he earned from his, I, I believe it was his grandfather, because he was known to destroy through slash and burn, you know, uh, raised earth tactics, Iroquois mm -hmm. towns, not just destroying, 
you know, military capacities, but destroying the very fabric of life, such as burning cornfields and ensuring that Haudenosaunee people were extirpated from the earth. And since he was the first president of the United States, every subsequent president, the Haudenosaunee have called town destroyer and have mm. believed that every president has earned that title. You have promised to become the head of the empire to destroy this empire, to undo this empire. That's right. What's the, what's the first thing you would do um, if, you, if you were elected president? Well, one is I would go back to that very powerful uh, uh, description and designation of George Washington, not only a slaveholder, but a town destroyer. And I'd say, how do I attempt to uh, initiate and inaugurate based on the wisdom of those whose towns were destroyed? to become someone who allows those towns to flower and flourish. So what is the opposite of a town destroyer? Well, it is a town flourisher. It's a town uh, uh, promoter that's trying to create conditions under which people can gain ass to be able to enact self-respect self-determination and still self-defense because i mean you can imagine that you know when the transitional moment it's going to be a lot of contestation and conflict my brother you know that the entrenched interests of the powers that be cut very deep and there's a, and you got a lot of gangsters and thugs who will do anything to preserve the status quo we know that uh, um but be able to turn over that town destroyer and transform it into a, uh, a town flourisher is something that I take as a starting point. And, and for me, you know, just in terms of policy, it's a matter of sitting down with the, uh, the leadership of indigenous peoples and letting them know that they have a priority in terms of resources. They have a priority in terms of focus. They have a priority in terms of attention so that they are be, they're able to live lives of flowering and flourishing on their own terms, given the 500, 500 or so year war against them. But what does it mean to bring that war to a close? You've, you've gotten this question a lot, but I, I think it's worth uh, asking because, you know, 44% of registered voters, this is according to a new M NBC poll, said that they would vote for a third party Indep or third party independent presidential candidate uh, if Joe Biden and former President Donald Trump are the two major nominees in 2024. Um, this is quite a shocking number, but when you look at you know, even the most recent presidential election in 2020, um, there was a voter turnout about two thirds of registered voters. It was it was a historic high, but still, there's a one third. There's a That's one right. third silent voice. That's How right. are you going to speak to to that sector of society who I th I think is protesting by not voting? Absolutely, absolutely. That's right. It's about 33, 35 percent. <laughs> Uh, and it's a matter of speaking to their understandable pessimism and cynicism that many of them rightly see that the system is rotten. They see that the politicians are corrupt. They see that big money and big donors and big benefactors fundamentally shape not just the party, but what particular candidates surface in the two parties. They see the ways in which the politicians, not just are chronic liars, but are too often cowards. They'll just say anything and succumb and cave into anything to win the next election or opt for popularity rather than integrity. One out of three of our, 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 our fellow citizens in the country say, we see this, we, have, we want nothing to do with that. So what happens when somebody comes along who says and sees the very thing they do and says, but I, but, but I want to participate. See? 
And I, I'm going to try not to lie. I'm going to try not to be cowardly. I'm going to speak some truths that get me in deep trouble. Not because I like to be in trouble, but because you can't be a truth teller and not be in trouble. It's just mm -hmm. impossible, you see. So the rejoinder that a lot of Democrats have to your campaign is that you're, you're going to be some kind of spoiler candidate. And you've been a longtime critic of the Democratic Party, but there's some people on the left who are trying to say that you should run within the Democratic Party. What is your response to that? Because you did vote for, you did uh, back Joe Biden's presidency in, in 2020. Yeah, by, at that time, I thought, to be part of an anti-fascist coalition was very important to push push Trump out. Uh, but I thought Biden was going to speak much more readily, given the impact of Brother Bernie, who I had supported, of course, twice. Uh, uh, I thought he was going to speak to the needs of poor and working people of all colors. And he had certain breakthrough with relief bill, child poverty did decrease, but then the bill expired and the corporate interest kicked in, the fossil fuel industry kicked in, and you've seen with the debt ceiling now, he's taking money away from the poor, expanding military, allowing pipelines all over, uh, pipelines with Manchin. He couldn't make a deal with Manchin for voting rights to push back the filibuster, but he can make a deal with Manchin for his pipeline. So it just let me know that uh, uh, this is business as usual. So I would say, you know, when you say about, talk about spoiler, you know, you say to yourself, well, what do we mean by spoiler? First, who is being spoiled? You, you see, if, 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 if Biden is leading us to World War III, if Biden's tied to Wall Street, Biden's tied to Silicon Valley and big tech, then it's, he's a weak candidate. And we're supposed to somehow be silent or somehow hold our noses and not tell the truth about that? You see, so that the, the notion of, well, your only option is what we say is the only option. No, 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 I'm not on the plantation. I'm not on your plantation. I think for myself. I love for myself. I laugh for myself. I vote for myself. And I think many people believe the same thing. You know, you don't own my vote. If you don't speak to my issues, then you're not going to get my vote. Or... If you don't speak to issues, I'm not going to vote at all, <laughs> right? Yeah. Back. This is what a large number, and I and I can understand that, you know, who mm -hmm. wants to put up with this kind of rottenness and corruption? And, and, and people present us as if, well, there is no alternative at all. Says who? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an excellent point. And I think, especially around the question of war, uh, and the the backing of uh, NATO, the NATO, the NATO war in Ukraine has had a, a lot of deleterious effects, not just, you know, on the economy here at home, but also on indigenous lands. The Willow Project in the uh, in, in, in Alaska, um, you know, Alaska natives were resisting the exploration of the North Slope because it gets into the Alaskan uh, National Wildlife Refuge, a place that, uh, you know, Biden promised to protect that. Uh, mm -hmm. That uh, Deborah Holland, you know, the first Native woman of the Department of Interior, promised to protect. The justification for opening that up was to relieve the pressure put on to Europe in its gas supplies that were cut off from Russia. Oh, okay. So there is an effect. You saw this in Standing Rock when the Dakota Access Pipeline was being built. It was to relieve the oil that was coming in from Venezuela. So Obama said, hey, why don't we develop our national supply to wean ourselves off of Iran, of Venezuela, and in fact, we'll implement sanctions against those countries. So how do you, how do you, th like, can you speak to that particular geopolitics of energy production? Because we have these gangster fossil fuel uh, executives who are controlling Congress, the White House, the Department of Interior. Biden has issued more oil and gas leases on federal land than Trump, the Trump administration is. So how can he be our first climate president? Yeah, exactly. But you can see how the pundits and his cheerleaders and bootlickers 
hide and conceal the truths that you just told. Hmm. I mean, what you just said has never really, I haven't heard it said on television. Mm -hmm. You know, it, fundamental truth, the international dynamics that lead toward these projects that promote not just ecological catastrophe, but are connected to the imperial foreign policy mm -hmm. and the response to the resistance to that imperial foreign policy, be it Venezuela or, or be it uh, uh, or, 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 or what's going on in, 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 in the Ukraine right now, what's going on with the uh, what, what you call rightly the uh, the NATO war, given the NATO's support, which is the NATO is in fact a fundamental arm of U.S. imperial po foreign policy, of U.S. global power. There's just no doubt about that. I know mainstream media doesn't, doesn't like to hear that at all. You know, they go at me tooth and nail. <laughs> oh, oh, oh my God, you must be anti-American. I'm, I'm trying to tell the truth about NATO, y'all. Mm -hmm. But but so that so so when I talk about this mantling the empire, uh, it means, in fact, that I'm trying to set in place a different set of dynamics that would not result in the kind of decisions that lead toward not just ecological catastrophe, but the violation of the sacred spaces mm -hmm. of priceless human beings, indigenous people. In Ask it could be in Alaska, it could be in South Dakota, North Dakota, whatever, wherever. Hmm. How how would you respond to the you know the Trump's designation of of countries like uh, Cuba as state sponsors of terror terrorism, and now that you know Biden hasn't done anything to reverse that, but it's led to what can only be described as a genocidal blockade on the country that's working in tandem with sanctions on Iran, sanctions on Venezuela that aren't targeting the leadership. They're, they're killing the poor. They're killing. That's right. That's right. Everyday people. Very, very much. So I mean, that, that, that goes hand in hand again. with what it means when you dismantle an empire, it means that you provide a, a whole new self understanding of the United States. Uh, that's truthful about its settler colonial history. It's truthful about its crimes against humanity. And it's also truthful about its attempts to engage in growth and maturity and to overcome that settler colonial legacy. And it means then that you no longer view yourself as an empire going around trying to get other nations to defer to you, you putting sanctions or you in involved in invasions and occupations when it's in your own interest. You become a nation among nations. Now, every nation state we know in the modern world has been founded on some form of barbarism, not just the United States. Uh, the nation state itself is an institutional matrix with a monopoly on the instrumentalities of violence with its own public administrations and so forth, institutions of public administration, you see, so that uh, we have to just be honest about what it means to create a nation state. It's always tied to some kind of violence. And that's what it means to be mindful and truthful about both the origins of any nation state, including the United States, and how do you attempt to minimize, lessen, alleviate the worst of it. And so when you think of, you know, the sanctions, well, I mean, the embargo against Cuba is, is, is a moral disgrace. And the impact that that's had on generations of precious Cubans. And of course, you know, in the 1980s, we were trying to get the United States to have a, just a sanction on South Africa. Oh, apartheid. No, no, we can't do that. The free market. No, we, that's a violation of our principles. Well, you've had an embargo, worse than sanctions against Cuba all these years. Oh, so your anti-communism is so intense that you're willing to engage in this kind of policy, but your anti-apartheid stance is empty, hollow, shallow. 
Well, the the sort of hypocrisy of that also lends itself to the way that the United States has almost unequivocally backed every policy that Israel has put into place in terms of dispossessing uh, Palestinians of their land, discriminating against them, expelling them, creating what the UN has now concluded exists both in the West Bank and in Gaza, open the world's largest open air prisons. But to but to the you know the the average kind of you know whether you're a Republican or a Democrat you know party hack, the questions of boycott, the questions of divestment, the questions of sanction sanctions are paramount in their minds an equation to anti-Semitism, when it, just equating the nation of Israel to all Jewish people is actually anti-Semitic. <laughs> it would be like equating the, you know, the United States to all Europeans or something like that. You know, it's not, there's no, there's no, that's not grounded in fact. And what, why do you think Palestine is the question, the moral question of, of our generation? Well, one is because when you look at U.S. foreign policy, uh, it's Egypt and Israel who receive most of the foreign aid. So that therefore, what is being done in Israel as well as Egypt is being done in the name of U.S. taxpayers. And we know that every budget is a moral uh, 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 site because the budget has priorities. A budget gives a certain kind of weight and value to certain peoples and less value for other peoples. And so if, for example, we were engaged in a thought experiment, there was a Palestinian occupation of Jews. Do you think the U.S. government would have the same attitude toward the Palestinian occupation of Jews? No, no. American, American government would give out moral prizes to those who supported the boycott, divestment, and sanction of the Palestinian occupation. It would be on the news every day of the way in which Jewish civilians are being uh, uh, um, killed and murdered and violated every day. But as soon as you flip it over and say the Israeli occupation of Palestinians, oh, you see the vast difference. You see the double standard there. It's overwhelming. Same would be true in terms of the Ukraine. Just the other day, after 500, 500 days of the criminal invasion of the Ukraine by the Russian Federation, there have been 200 babies who have been killed. And there's been stories all across the nation, stories all across TV, radio. 2014, 550 Palestinian babies killed in 50 days. Not a mumbling word said by one American politician or a American figure in public life for the most part. Again, so is it clear, just like an indigenous life, just like a black life in the history of the United States, Palestinian life, even that of a precious Palestinian baby, has no moral weight. Well, you see that to me is a crime against humanity. It really is. And it, what it does is it normalizes and it institutionalizes a level of human hatred and human indifference toward the humanity of Palestinians. And that has to be said over and over and over again. And can you imagine the depth of the hypocrisy when you say, when I say that and somebody says, well, you must be anti-Semitic. I said, well, I just told you that it wouldn't make a difference whose babies they were. They're human beings that I'm defending. You're using the anti-Semitic charge in order to trivialize the suffering of Palestinians, in order to hide and conceal the suffering of Palestinians. And we will not allow you to do that. And I find myself in this presidential campaign where people come at you so intensely. Why are you always talking about the West Bank? Why are you always talking about Gaza? Why is the Palestinians always on your mind? And I say, well, I will never under any conditions sell out my Palestinian brothers and sisters. 
I just won't. If I'm the last person in the room raising their cause, I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. Even though, as you know, you know, it's a taboo issue. And we won't get into the Harvard controversy. It got, <laughs> me, got me in trouble for doing exactly that. You know yeah. what I mean? I said, well, okay, I just don't have a job then. I, because uh, th there's no way. To, but I would say the same thing about indigenous peoples. That, I would say the same thing about black people. I'd say the same thing about poor white people. I'd say the same thing about dollars in India. Same thing about Roma in, 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 in Europe, so-called gypsies. I'd say the same thing about landless workers or peasants in Brazil. It's a moral and spiritual issue. It takes us in many ways right back to where we started with your magnificent ancestors and that soul crafting and that character shaping and that virtue uh, uh, inducing activity of what it is to be a spiritual human being with rich past and pr future, and we embody it in the present. You kind of, uh, you face a really daunting challenge, uh, not just, you know, in, the, in this presidential bid, but also uh, just the changes that not, not only you, but many of us are <clears throat> pushing for in this particular moment in time. They're not changes that we want to see, there are changes that we have to see, that we need to see if there's going to be a viable future on this planet. How do you plan to get this message out to the masses of people to, to mobilize them beyond just maybe a presidential run, but to something that's more sustainable and a movement, something that we should have seen after the Bernie campaign, something to capture um, <clears throat> the momentum and the movement outside the two-party duopoly? Point one is, again, this campaign is nothing but a moment in the movement, and what we need is a mass movement. We need a mass movement of solidarity, which cuts across color, cuts across gender, cuts across sexual orientation, religious identity, and national identity. And uh, um, that's the only hope that we really have. God bless you. It's the only hope we really have. And I'm just praying that... Uh, I can be used, that God can use me, crack vessel that I am, in such a way that I can open doors and I can generate some kind of uh, energies uh, that convince people that it's worth becoming part of a movement. Because in the end, that's the only thing we can fall back on. When you have organized money coming at you and trying to crush you, if you don't have organized people, get crushed you do because as we said before you know well we've got some gangsters and thugs running things and they will do anything it's like like the mafia man at its worst it, they'll do anything to crush you uh, and yet even all of the folk we know who have been crushed you think of your great ancestors been crushed i think of mine that they didn't crush the spirit. They didn't crush the, 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 the legacies. They didn't crush the memories. And they didn't crush the sources of resilience. Hmm. Well, I hope you take a, a little bit of inspiration from Bernie Sanders' campaign because he was the only presidential candidate who actually campaigned on an Indian reservation <laughs> during his... Uh, he, he campaigned down in the Navajo Nation um, at, uh, in Arizona. Uh, and I hope that you really take to heart that, you know, the, the kind of broad swaths of red, the wrong kind of red, <laughs> within the heartland of this country, um, you know, are often surrounding islands of blue people who I, you know, I believe vote not necessarily with the Democratic Party, but against the alternative. Right. Uh, and who are living in states such as South Dakota, where there is a lot of reactionary, you know, racism. And and when we live in a, a time where people are saying, you know, we have too much tribalism, I think we actually need more tribalism. We need the tribalism that's not racist, the kind of idea that we're primitive tribalists, but the idea that we need a tribal sovereignty to protect the lands and waters uh, of this land so that not just for the benefit of indigenous people, because you drink water, I drink water. Everybody That's drinks right. water. It's not just an indigenous problem. It's everybody's problem. Um, and just I have two, you know two final questions. This one is how how do you you know how do you see 
questions of of tribal sovereignty and the issues that we're facing as as not just you know um, uh, tribal nations, but people in this country need to understand that we have a nation to nation relationship that the United States isn't, you know, a Western liberal democracy where there's only one kind of citizen. We have collective, you know, citizenship, Mexican Americans were brought in as an entire group of people, black Americans were brought in as an entire group of people. Native people were brought in as entire groups of people. That's what makes us different. We have a collective sense of peoplehood. Um, right. And how, right. how do you see that as, as central to, uh, maybe we don't want to call it the American project, but a kind of future country that we don't necessarily live in right now? Ooh, no, but I just, I, I resonate deeply with that vision, man. I mean, that goes hand in hand with dismantling empire, and hand in hand with dismantling imperial perceptions hand in hand with dismantling colonized mentalities uh, and what it means to be able to live in a world based on that kind of vision you see that, that in so many ways that's uncharted territory that settler colonialism has generated ways of looking at the world that has become so predominant that it's hard to even conceive of what you just talked about. And yet what you just talked about must become a fundamental starting point. I'm, I'm hoping what we can do, my brother, is that uh, two things. One, that you and I should do exactly what we're doing now in front of a major uh, uh, event uh, somewhere in Princess Town, no, that's a, somewhere yes. in, around, around Minneapolis. <laughs> that was my final <laughs> question. When are you coming to Minneapolis? <laughs> no, you, you know, I was just there. I was just there at Westminster a couple of months ago. You probably know, but I mean, it was for a different event. Yeah, you know, but we, and you know, God bless our uh, our Presbyterian brothers and sisters. We had a good time. They're very prophetic in their own way. Doctor Cornell West, it was such a pleasure having you on the Red Nation podcast and. You know, is there, what's the best way to support and to find out more about what you're doing? Yeah, it's just uh, Dr. Cornell West 24 at gmail.com. That's the, uh, 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 the site, you know, for the, uh, the campaign itself. Very, very much so. But as people know, I mean, I, I'm not talking solely about the campaign. I'm just trying to get people to uh, uh, straighten their backs up, become more active in their own communities, become part of movements that are fighting for justice. And it overlaps with the campaign, but it goes, what, what, what those movements are about go far, far beyond the campaign. And that's probably the most important uh, thing in so many ways. Well, but God bless your family. I know I got to get to this next Zoom. Though. For sure. All but, right. But uh, really, though, man, love you, love you, brother. You, you, you too.